we welcome you to worship today. And as we do so, we acknowledge that Calvary United Church stands on Treaty 6 territory. We pay our respects to our elders, both past and present, wherever we find ourselves this morning. We recommit to our status as an affirming ministry within the United Church of Canada and strive to be an open-minded, inclusive, and welcoming place of worship. It is our deepest hope that all people might feel at home in this space, and we give thanks to God for this Sabbath day where we join our hearts and minds in prayer. One of the greatest joys of worship is that it is not a solo act. We gather together, we find joy and God in the act of connection. So, as we begin this morning, I'm going to ask you to do something uncomfortable. <laughs> Turn and face someone that you know, someone you're close to, someone you came with today. Yep, turn and face each other. If there's three of you, you can make room for three of you. All right, everyone looking at somebody? <laughs> ah, this is so great. I love when you guys feel uncomfortable. Okay. <laughs> All right, looking at each other. Look at someone. And if you don't have someone to look at, you can look at me. But don't. I had to, yeah. They're sitting right behind you. Look at them. Michael, this is a growing edge, man. All right, that's fine. If you're looking at, she's looking at other, all right, what? whatever. John, you can look at Colleen, she's up there. All right, so looking at the person that you're looking at, repeat after me. Welcome to worship. <laughs> I am glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. Surely God is in this space. Surely God is in this space. I see God in your face. 
I see God in your face. Let us worship together. Let us worship together. How does a weary world practice peace? By listening before we speak and saying sorry when we need to. By advocating for justice and caring for our neighbor. By practicing Sabbath and forgiving 70 times 7. By choosing grace over hate and opening the doors literally and metaphorically for each other. By being kind, saying please and thank you, and sharing with those around us. All of this builds peace. There are a million ways to practice peace. So today, we light the candle of peace as a reminder and a charge. These are the candles of out in peace. One of, the weary, one of the ways we find joy in a weary world is through connection. The prayer of confession is a place of connection with God. In this prayer, we get to come before God with our full, messy, honest selves. And in the midst of that mess, God tells us that we are loved, claimed, and forgiven. There is no greater joy than that. So join me in the prayer of confession, not because you have to, but because you can, let us connect with our merciful God. God of laughter, God of open front doors and family reunions, we confess that we often doubt good news. We move through this world waiting for the other shoe to drop, 
waiting for life to fall apart, waiting for our humanity to get the best of us. Instead of leaning into joy, we lean into scarcity, we lean into fear, we lean into isolation. Forgive us for forgetting that joy is amplified when shared. Heal the wounds we have from past years and teach us how to throw open our doors like Elizabeth. Show us how to find joy in connection with you and with each other. We'll make our silent prayers of confession. I imagine that when we come before God with the truth of our lives, God meets us like Elizabeth meets Mary in our scripture today. The door is thrown open, there is laughter, there is joy, there is embracing, and it is holy. So trust this, believe this. We are claimed, we are loved, we are forgiven, we will find joy. Today I'm going to be speaking about kindergarten in a refugee camp. Being a child in a refugee camp means facing lots of uncertainty at a very young age. In addition to food and water being scarce, education is generally not easily, not easily accessible. Some children were born in the camps while others fled with their families at a very young age. Either way, living in a refugee camp means children may not learn crucial cognitive and social skills. Since 1950, the Joint Christian Committee for Social Services has provided skills training and services for refugees living in a refugee camp in Lebanon. One of their incredible in initiatives is kindergarten program where children can engage in learning in a happy, secure place. Hundreds of children have graduated from JCC's kindergarten program with the skills they need to thrive. After graduating, children continue in schools that welcome the, the basic knowledge and values they have learned. Your generosity, through mission and service, helps keep children learning around the world. Thank you. Our confession has been heard and our offering received. Let us turn to one another and offer the peace of Christ. Peace be with you.
Good morning, my friends, and welcome to this Advent 2 children's time. This morning, we're going to be talking about peace. And I was kind of hoping to talk with our friend Robbie about peace, but I don't see him anywhere with us this morning. That's because I'm over here, Sam. You're over where? Over here. Oh boy, where is that dragon? Hmm. You guys see him? Oh, there you are. You're, what are you doing way up there, Robbie? Why don't you come up and see? All right. Come on, everybody. Let's go see what do Robbie's doing way up on the balcony. All right, my friends. Here we are with Robbie and a bunch of glitter. Robbie, what are you up to? Oh, I'm trying to spread peace. Okay. Well, I can see why that would be your goal. We are trying our very best to spread peace this week. Far and wide, we're trying to cease conflicts like our hymn say this morning and generally just sit with peace in our hearts on this second week of Advent. But I have to admit, I'm not sure where the glitter is coming from. The banner, of course. The banner? What banner, Robbie? The peace banner, Sam. It's right over there. Oh, of course. Yes, our beautiful peace banner. Okay, I see our beautiful peace banner, but I'm still a little bit lost what is with the glitter and why we're on the balcony spreading peace. When I look at the banner, all I want to do is spread more peace and have everybody feel it. We are seriously short on live doves around this church. There's plenty of lovely symbolic ones, but none that could really do the job of actually flying around and spreading peace. So I looked up what else there was on the banner to spread peace, and there it was. Oh, you saw the glitter. Of course. Now I see... Glitter! So I thought to myself, what is the best way to get this glittery piece to everybody that comes to the church? I know you always have more glitter than any five people in your basement, so I thought I would come up here and spread the glittery piece as everybody came into the sanctuary. <sighs> they like that, right? So peaceful and so pretty. Well, Robbie, while I think that spreading peace in Advent is very, very important, I'm not sure how people will feel about, about having peace rain down on them from glitter or about how they'll feel having to clean that piece and that glitter out of their hair and their clothes. And our property committee, they probably won't feel very peace-filled if they have to clean our pews and our pew cushions. How about you and I work together to figure out another way that we can spread peace? Oh, good thing I hadn't started yet. Yes, I think something a little less messy to spread the peace, perhaps. Okay, my friends, I have had a brilliant idea, I think, of a way we can spread peace. I was thinking it's easiest to spread peace to everybody around us if we ourselves are calm first. When we're calm, we're ready to listen, we're ready to problem solve with other people, and we're better able to wait when we're calm, all of which brings with it peace. So this week, I thought that we could spread peace by giving ourselves a little gift. We're going to give ourselves the gift of a calm down bottle. What a great idea, Sam. What you're going to need for a calm down bottle is you're going to need a bottle and it has to have a lid with it because of course we're pouring something inside it. I have two, one for me and one for Robbie. You're also going to need some hot water. You're going to need some clear glue and some glitter. I picked silver so that it matched our advent banner and because it feels very Christmassy to me. You're also going to need a whisk to help whisk it up. I'm using this bowl because it has a nice pouring spout so I would recommend you do that at home too but any bowl you use could be fine as long as you have a funnel or something. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add the glue to the hot water. We're going to be generous with it. We want lots and lots and lots. Some people said even use an entire bottle of glue. I'm not using an entire bottle of glue because that feels a little wasteful, but I'm going to use a good helping of glue. And then we're going to whisk. And the hot water is just to help the glue kind of bind with it and not get clumpy because we don't want clumpy glue in the bottle because then our glitter won't do what we want it to. The more glue you use, the slower your glitter will fall to the bottom. So that's the only difference there. And then we're going to take our glitter. Yes, I'm taking the lid off the glitter glue. It's always a scary thing, opening a new glitter. 
and we're going to use a lot. I'm going to use a lot. You can use however much you like. The more glitter you use, the more it spreads out in the bottle, the more cotton you get as you watch it drop. So I'm going to use quite a fair bit. And again, we're going to need our whisk so that it all mixes up. Okay, so lid back on so we don't spill the glitter. We wouldn't want that. And then we're going to whisk it up. And the last step of this is pouring it in our bottles. Carefully as we can, as to not spill. We want to get our bottles nice and full with this mixture. And I have a lot of glitter that's left on the bottom, so I'm just going to stir this up again. You might have to do that too at home. And if you feel like there's not enough color in your bottle, you could also add some food coloring. I think there's plenty of color in mine because we're doing silver glitter. Maybe if I was doing a different color, I'd feel differently. I'm going to add just a little more glitter to the top of the bottle. Do, 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 try not to glit glitter everywhere. Okay. And then we're going to put back on the lid, wherever I put it. There it is. You can see that the glitter settles really, really fast in the bottom of the container. I'm going to use this container for this, my second bottle in a, in a few minutes after I show you this one. So this one, you can see, I think, you can see that there's lots of glitter inside and the glue makes it fall slowly. So when we're looking at our calm bottles, what we're gonna do is we're gonna watch the glitter fall from one side to the other. We're gonna watch it swirl inside there. And we're gonna let all of those feelings that are inside ourselves go when we're watching these bottles. We're gonna just breathe as we watch this and calm down and let go of all of those things that we're feeling inside. And then when we're able to feel calm, we'll be able to feel peace and we'll be able to spread that peace. All right, my friends. That is it for our Advent 2 gathering this week. If you want to make a calm bottle, you're more than welcome to. You're more than welcome to give these as, uh, give these as gifts. They make fantastic gifts, especially for little people in your life. All right, my friends, you have a great week. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Our scripture this morning is from Luke chapter 1, verses 24 to 45. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, This is what the Lord has done for me in this time, when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what this greeting might be, and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive your, in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be, born with ho will be born holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now you, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. 
In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to the Gideon town in, a hill, in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary greet, Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with Holy Spirit and excitement and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed are the, is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy, and blessed is she who believes, believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken by her Lord. Hear what the scriptures are saying to the church. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each and every heart be acceptable unto you, O God, our Creator and Redeemer. Amen. Of all the stories found in the biblical narrative of Jesus' conception and birth, the story of Mary and Elizabeth has always been a favorite. There is something deeply moving in how these two women, one unexpectedly old and one unexpectedly young, find themselves sharing these mystifying and, let's be honest, slightly terrifying birth announcements. Buried into this connection is the fact that one of these babies is to be the herald for the other. No pressure there. And as such, these women's lives are divinely twisted together for all time. Prior to Mary showing up on her doorstep, Elizabeth has spent over five months in isolation. Five months alone, with on, the only other person in the house being her husband, who's unable to speak. We don't know if that's a blessing or a curse. <laughs> now, being a pandemic people, we all know how hard isolation can be, especially if you're really, really on your own. Many of our homes got real quiet in 2020. Oddly, the Gospel of Luke never tells us why Elizabeth is alone at this time. Maybe she was isolated for the same reason that Zechariah was silenced. Maybe she chose to stay home because she had questions and assumed her neighbors would also have questions about everything that was happening and she just didn't want to deal with it. Maybe her faith wavered and fear moved in as she wondered, does God know how old I am? We've been waiting for so long and now God decides it's time? Or, I've wanted this for as long as I can remember, but now that it's happening, I'm not so sure. But these are all things that we can only wonder about because the only thing we get is one sentence. This is what God wants, and this is the time God has chosen for it to happen. For this, my shame is lifted. Now, what of Mary? She's still early in her pregnancy, weeks along rather than months. I like to think that as soon as she finished up with the angel, she quickly tossed a few things in a bag and headed for the hills, walking the 130 kilometers from her home in Nazareth to Elizabeth's home in Hebron. As she walked, I imagine her contemplating all that the angel had said, and can you imagine what was going through her mind? More questions and answers, I expect. Of course, we aren't given access to her thoughts either. We don't know if she questioned God's wisdom in choosing her. We don't know if she questioned God's understanding of the human reproductive system. We don't know if she left on her own accord or if she was sent away by her family. Regardless, what we do witness is her resolve. There are no songs of rejoicing for Mary at this moment, no gender reveal parties, no baby showers, no cute little pregnancy photo shoots. In fact, we don't really get a taste of joy at all. That high intensity and expected feeling of delight for either Mary or Elizabeth until the two of them are together. You heard it in this scripture. The joy was so intense that Elizabeth's baby did womb gymnastics at the sound of Mary's voice, and the Holy Spirit itself descended upon her and filled her up. And this simple moment of doorstep joy shows us something very important about the emotion. Joy needs connection with others, with God, with nature, with the universe. Like light, joy cannot exist in a vacuum. 
The ancient Greeks knew joy, or Cairo, as the culmination of being and the good mood of the soul. It is something deeper than happiness, which tends to linger on the surface of our beings, and while a longer-lasting, more stable emotion perhaps tends to be focused mostly on self, our happiness tends to be more circumstantial. Whereas joy, well, it digs a little deeper. Brene Brown has done extensive research into the wide range of emotions that humans experience, and through this work, she has come to understand that joy is the intense feeling of deep spiritual connection, pleasure, and appreciation. The good mood of the soul, fed by the connection we feel with other people, with God, and with the world around us. The season of Christmas, it is brimming with joy and joyfulness and rejoicing. It's in our carols, in our cards, in our decorations. Thank God it's in the baking. You cannot eat peppermint almond bark and not feel joyful. <laughs> but in truth, it's all a reflection of the fact that during this season, we spend a lot of time intentionally connecting with other people. People we love, people we haven't seen in a while, our church communities with neighbors, coworkers, and it's fantastic. All of it is amazing. For us churchy types, we get to double down as we spend time connecting to the birth story, looking for the joy that comes when we recognize how it speaks to our connection with the divine, the incarnation. God chose to come and be with us. And we do this in lots of different ways, in big things like Christmas hampers and giving to those less fortunate than us. And we do it through little things like lighting Advent candles, which for the record, if you're a three-year-old, is a big thing. So I think it comes down to perspective. He did great. <laughs> Point is, we do all of this to try to invite joy into the world. And we thrive on being connected to something other than ourselves. In a world that is so self-centered, it feels really great, truly. But, don't you hate how I always have a but and ruin the party? But, like we talked about last week, finding joy might seem a little hard to achieve right now because so many of us are feeling soul-weary. As much as we long to be here, as much as we enjoy this time of year, there are those among us whose hearts are heavy. There is so much happening in and around us that breaks the connection with others, that our heads and hearts and souls hurt, making it hard just to get through the day, let alone find joy in the living of it. And then Christmas bustles in with its joy and its brightness and its yearning for connection, and it bumps up against those of us who are living with disconnection. And it's kind of jarring, that reality of loss, loss of loved ones, way of life, loss of relationships or jobs, loss of dreams. And maybe some of us come to wonder how or if we'll ever feel that deep sense of joy again. Here's the thing. Weariness's voice is loud. And it drowns out our ability to hear the good news that's happening around us, with the people around us. And it can keep us from engaging with joy. Instead of that, fear and anxiety slip in. Instead, and like dear old Charlie Brown here, we start to waver. I can easily imagine the fear and anxiety that both Elizabeth and Mary must have been feeling. Elizabeth as she sat in that quiet house alone. Mary as she wandered that quiet road alone. But as they got to greet each other, well, somehow in the midst of their own individual tumult, they were able to hold joy for the other person. It's an incredibly beautiful, holy moment. And in the acknowledgement of the amazingness of the other and what God was doing, how God was working through the other person, both women were able to flip it and find joy for themselves. It just came crashing in. Connection amplifies joy, emboldens it, grows it. 
when our weary souls hold joy for another person, when we open our broken hearts to God, when we hear the quiet voice of good news in the middle of the chaos, when we play with our friends, when we know we are loved and worthy of that love, joy grows. This week, Nadia Bowles Weber was interviewed on the We Can Do Hard Things podcast with Glennon Doyle, where she said, when people go around saying, nah, I don't actually need access to anything other than myself, I'm like, wow, that's awesome for you. I desperately need more than just me, because if I'm all that I have and all that there is, I'm out of luck. And this truth is played out in community. So the times that we don't have it in us, when we don't have enough energy, joy, compassion, love, whatever to give, we can turn to our community and say, I just, I can't today. I just can't do this today. And our community says back, no problem. We've got this for you. We can do this knowing that the next time it comes around, you'll have it for the other person. Life is a team sport. My friend Lindsay Moan, her parents-in-law are here today. She's minister in Delisle. She and I have this line that um, you will have your mental breakdown and I'll keep it together. And then when I have my mental breakdown, she keeps it together. The catch is to not have a mental breakdown at the same time. It's been 20 years so far we've been good. Life is a team sport. Of course, all of this is easier said than done because it can be hard. Being connection with others, it's hard because it requires honesty and vulnerability and it forces us to face our fears and to interact with each other, which makes every introvert in the room squirm. We have to open ourselves to the other despite the fact that hurt, jealousy, judgment might move in. But if we are brave enough to truly meet each other where we are, be it in love or fear, hope or sorrow, the potential for joy to work its magic, well, it's holiness. So Mary meets Elizabeth in her isolation, and Elizabeth meets Mary in her uncertainty, and in moments, mere seconds, their fear is replaced with overwhelming joy. Elizabeth bursts into song. Mary bursts into song. It's incredible. The more we make room for joy in our lives, the more fear is pushed away. The more that fear is pushed away, the more we see the world and all its wonders with awe and gratitude. And this will happen, I promise you, even with tears of sorrow in our eyes, even with broken hearts in our chests. And the smaller fear gets, the bigger joy grows. But we can't do it alone. It won't work. We need each other. We certainly need God for any of that to happen. A story to end with. Brene Brown, in her book, Atlas of the Heart, tells a story of her daughter, Ellen, during which she had the privilege of witnessing the expansive, incredible nature of joy and gratitude at play. She wrote, This seems like yesterday, but it happened 16 years ago when Ellen was in first grade and we played hooky one afternoon and spent the day at Herman Park. At one point, we were on a paddle boat in the middle of a pond when I realized she had stopped pedaling and was sitting perfectly still in her seat. Her head was tilted back and her eyes were closed. The sun was shining on her uplifted face and she had a quiet smile. I was so struck by her beauty and her vulnerability and the joy in her face that I could barely catch my breath. I watched her for a full minute. But when she didn't move, I started to get a little nervous. <laughs> Ellie, is everything okay, sweetie? Her smile widened and she opened her eyes. She looked at me and said, oh, I'm fine, Mama. I was just making a picture memory. I'd never heard of a picture memory, but I liked the sound of it. What's that mean, I asked. Oh, a picture memory is a picture I take in my mind when I'm really, really happy. I close my eyes and I take a picture, so when I'm feeling sad or scared or lonely, I can look at my picture memories. This was Joy. That girl sitting on a paddle boat with her mother. It was a swirl of deep spiritual connection, pleasure, and appreciation. 
Elizabeth and Mary standing together on that doorstep in Hebron, that was joy. The swirl of deep spiritual connection, pleasure, and appreciation. May we open ourselves to the same this year, despite or in spite of our weary souls in this weary world, that we might feel the same, that swirl of deep spiritual connection, pleasure, and appreciation. May it be so. Amen. Let's say this affirmation of faith together. We believe that joy is a sacred gift, existing on a plane deeper than happiness, stemming from the truth that we belong to God. We believe that joy is not meant for us to wish. Joy is meant to be shared, weaving us together in laughter and in hope. And when joy feels impossibly out of reach, we believe that part of the sacred community is leaning on one another. So together we say, I will share my joy when yours runs out. You will share your joy when mine runs out. And in doing so, we will both see God. Amen. Let us pray. God of today and God of tomorrow, we come to you this morning to thank you for the way that joy binds us together. Thank you for contagious laughter, for inside jokes, for stories around dinner tables that can make us laugh until we cry. Thank you for the familiar sound of a loved one's chuckle and for the universality of smile lines. What a gift you have given us. Our text today reminds us that joy is better when shared. So together we thank you in particular for the Elizabeths and Marys in our lives. Thank you for the people who spark joy in us. Thank you for the people who pull us out of our shells, who teach us how to dance and show us how to laugh. Thank you for those who declare, blessed are you. In a moment of gratitude, we silently lift their names to you now. Holy God, although we know that joy is better when shared, there are days when it is easier said than done. Like Elizabeth, who stayed in isolation for months after receiving her good news, we too have a tendency to choose fear over joy. Without the help of someone at our door, we can often keep our joys to ourselves. So gracious God, when those days come, when the waters of fear and anxiety rise, when isolation steals our joy, comfort us. Comfort us like a shepherd with their flock. Gather us into your arms and carry us to safer ground that we might experience joy in the ways you have in store for us. And until that promised day, like Mary and Elizabeth, we will do our best to keep finding one another. Like Mary and Elizabeth, we will do our best to open the door to one another, to you and to the joy that connection brings. Together, God of life, we unite our voices in hope and peace praying the words that you, your son taught us, calling you by whichever name feels most like home, we say. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil.
Okay, just real quick, because I know, oh, it's already late. Okay, do you want to hear a story? Yeah? Okay. Half of you are like, yeah, and half of you are like, oh, Lord. Okay. <laughs> Short version. When I was grade nine, you're not going to believe this, I would have been, what, 14 years old? I'm like a total nightmare. Like, I was just, like, you know that, you know that teenager, right? The, <sighs> what? What do you want? Yeah, I'll clean my room. That was me. I was shocking, I know, right? Because otherwise, I was perfect. <laughs> I was a perfect child. But my mom hit perimenopause at the same time I hit puberty, and it went south quick. <laughs> and I remember just feeling dark. Like, no adult in my life understood me. And, like, in truth, they did not understand. But it was just such a dark, dark time. It's like that when you're 14, for most of our 14-year-olds. But around that time, this woman showed up in my house. Her name was Iris. She was my father's mother, my grandmother. And that woman was hilarious. <laughs> she was about this tall. She had white hair, piercing blue eyes a thick Scottish accent, so half the people couldn't understand her, which she thought was hilarious, because she could get away with saying anything. <laughs> and she was so funny. And one day we found ourselves visiting relatives, her brother, it's a long story, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, we were visiting relatives, and we had to share a bed, my grandmother and I. And my grandmother would have been, well, she was like super old, she was like 70. <laughs> <laughs> which in the 90s was like 102, right? So she decided that we should have a farting contest because what else would you do with your grandmother in someone else's house in the middle of the night? So she wakes me up and she, and she farts. And I'm like, Grandma. She's like, I bet she can't do it louder. And so we end up having this farting contest. Then she starts laughing so hard, she rolled over and fell out of bed. Boom. Lands on the ground. So then I start laughing, because my ancient grandmother at 70 just rolled out of bed, hit the ground, but then she never came back up. So then I was like, Grandma? And I like tip over, and I'm about to go to see if she's okay, and I can hear her under the bed. And she's rummaging around under the bed, and she's laughing, and then she comes up, popping up over the side of the bed like this. I can't see her. All I can hear is like rumbling around, and all of a sudden she pops up, with a kettle or a teapot and a, and a tea, a cut, like a teacup on a saucer. And she's like, fancy a cuppa. <laughs> and I'm like, what? She's like, you can't believe what they've got under this bed. And it was clear that they, in, a, in anticipation of us coming to visit, they had just taken everything and shoved it under the furniture. <laughs> so we had a great night just pulling out all this stuff from under the bed. <laughs> anyway, my grandmother was my Elizabeth in my darkness, when I was just in my head and in my emotions and the world was bleh, my grandmother was able to say, fancy a cuppa. <laughs> and she just reminded me what joy feels like. It's like priming a pump sometimes. We forget. We forget what it feels like. And then you just kind of lose your direction. Joy needs connection with someone else, with God with the universe around us, whatever. We can't find joy on our own. So for those people in your life who have brought you joy, say a prayer of gratitude for them today. For those moments in your life when you've been able to be Elizabeth, when you've been able to turn to the Marys in your life who are feeling lost and overwhelmed and bleh, when you've been able to bring them, them joy and remind them that they are Blessed in God's eyes. Oh, feel proud of yourself for that. When you're losing your joy, I'll hold it for you. When I'm losing mine, will you hold it for me? And together, we will make our way to this glorious Christmas Eve. Family of faith, as we leave this place, remember it is a weary world we are going into. So may we speak tenderly to our neighbors and to ourselves. May we do good as ours to do. May we choose connection. May we hold on to hope.
And maybe remember that God took on flesh for us. We humans are God's beloved. The world needs it, this holy joy. The world needs that too, God's endless love. And all God's people said, Amen.